choose the cheapest option. But as we all know, a low price often means poor quality. When you consider the whole life cycle cost of a product, buying things that simply don't break will be the best option, both financially and environmentally. That's why Vestra's goal is to produce furniture that lasts forever. When our designers approach a new design, sustainability is a key factor. Therefore, we use short haul materials of the best quality. Slow growing in its cold Nordic environment, Scandinavian pine gets extra hard. This makes it exceptionally durable and well suited for outdoor use. Nordic steel is hot dip galvanized and powder coated to meet Norwegian offshore standards. The steel production generates 30% lower greenhouse gas emissions than the world average. Having taken such measures to select the best materials, we do not hesitate to offer a lifetime guarantee against rust and a 15-year guarantee on wood and paint. Vestra offers spare parts for all the furniture we've ever made. After many years of use, worn-out furniture can be returned to our factory for restoration and reuse. So that's how our products last forever and ever and ever. This aids Vestra on our way to becoming the most sustainable furniture company in the world. Our products may cost a little bit more, but in the end, if you consider the whole life cycle cost, we believe no one can beat us. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our first FICA of 2022. Um, we're really happy to be back and particularly to kick off this year with the first of three FICAs on inclusive landscapes. Uh, the reason why this is titled Exclusive Landscapes will become clear shortly with luck. Um, each month between now and March, we're going to talk about SDG 10, uh, Reduced Inequalities, and the target 10.2, which is to empower and promote the social, economic and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, origin, religion or economic or other status. And this SDG is a big one for us at Vestra as we seek to support diversity wherever we work and aim to create truly inclusive and welcoming places through our furniture. And today we're joined by Ross Atkin and Paul Lincoln, both of whom I've known for quite a long time, we won't get into that, uh, for a conversation about the everyday difficulties, in particular faced by those with sight or mobility impairment while navigating the public realm. Ross is an independent designer and researcher based in London, and he has a long-standing interest in accessibility of the public realm. And he works on both research and design projects for highway authorities, charities and others. He has extensive practical experience of shadowing people in urban environments and vast expertise, both theoretical and practical in this area. And Paul, if anyone, uh, the landscape architects amongst you out there will know, um, is the editor of Landscape, the journal of our institute, the Landscape Institute. And the next edition uh, published in February, I believe, will focus on inclusive environments. And Paul's editing will, without doubt, ensure a fascinating read on this vast subject. So today we're going to focus on what makes a landscape equitable or conversely, what may actually exclude those moving through or within it. And obviously there are elements such as tactile paving, armrests on seats and well-maintained site fabric, which are vital to support this. But beyond that, the subtleties of placing something in unexpected in the urban realm can have a really negative impact on those who rely on standard cues to navigate safely and confidently. And Ross is going to run through some of these impacts, drawing on his research to offer insights into what we really need to provide to support autonomy and independence. So welcome to Ross and Paul. Um, I'm Romy, for any of those who don't know me, I'm the commercial director at Vestra here in the UK. And I should just mention that we're recording this webinar for catch up purposes. I hope that's OK with you. So please do come in, Ross. I'll just uh, give a little bit more background into this and uh, we'll, we'll carry on with your presentation shortly. Um, I just wanted to mention that the, the goal of SDG 10.2 is to reduce inequalities within and among countries, as I mentioned, based on any 
uh, of the protected characteristics. And here in the UK, we may think we're less affected than in many other countries, but actually inequalities threaten long-term social and economic development, and they prevent the reduction of poverty and destroy people's sense of fulfillment and self-worth. And I think that's what we're particularly talking about here. We can't strive for sustainable development and make the planet better for all if we're excluding people from everyday life. And it needs to be achieved to ensure dignity for everybody. So for me, the particular impact of this subject on people's physical and mental health is of real interest. The loneliness epidemic we currently face in the UK is compounded when people just feel they can't leave their home for fear of what they might encounter on a simple walk. So I'm sure many of you have questions and thoughts on this. Please add them to the Q&A tab rather than the chat tab. And I'm about to hand over to Ross, but I'm just going to um, launch a quick poll for you. We were quite keen to do this maybe before and after Ross's presentation to see if anybody's views have changed. Um, I hope you can see that. Um, but if you would just answer that one fairly simple question, hopefully, what of these are your top three in terms of um, importance when you're thinking about designing and managing the public realm for inclusivity? If you would be willing to vote now, Ooh, they're coming in. Oops, sorry, it's all gone haywire. IT, tech, help. <laughs> uh, I think there's many more of you that could be completing this, so we'll give it a little bit longer. And uh, I don't know, have you got any thoughts, Ross, on which you think will be the top three from your list? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I thought. I mean, I think it would be very interesting to have a discussion about this after the after the mm. after the presentation. Yeah. I mean, no, definitely. I mean, obviously, they're all really, really important, and it's pretty cruel to make you choose three. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I think that there's. I mean, yeah. I, I guess I've got some views on some of them, and, and some that I think might be surprising. I don't know. I think it'll be an interesting conversation. Well, interesting. What well, one of them has been picked by everybody. Only one of them. So yeah. Um, We've got another about five of you who haven't replied. So I think we're going to have to get, oh yeah, it's going up now. We're going to have to just uh, move on, but um, I'll end it now and share it now so that you can just see what we're, what I'm looking at. Um, so interestingly, level access over and above anything else really um, by a long way. Tactile paving, that old uh, chestnut, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, seating, that's good to hear. Lighting, yeah, so you can see that, but we'll bring this in later and uh, I think we can have a chat about that as you mentioned. So over to you, Ross, I'll stop sharing now and um, it's going to be an interesting uh, presentation. I absolutely am convinced of that. Uh well, um, thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you for the incredibly kind introduction. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll try to do my best to make it interesting, <laughs> as you've as you as interesting as you build it. Um, okay, so uh, I I spend a lot or have spent a lot of time over the last uh, decade and a bit following disabled people around on streets with their permission, um, and trying to capture their sort of lived experience of um, dealing with. Uh, with our streets and um, and then feed, trying to feed that back to people that are making design decisions about streets in um, useful, hopefully useful ways. Um, and in that time, I've done uh, 12 different projects. Um, uh, what have I written? I can't see what I've written because I've got the thing in front of me. Oop. Um, anyway, uh, Oh, 12 years, I've done eight projects, I've shadowed um, or, or done in-depth Zoom interviews with 126 individuals in five different cities. Um, and uh, the most of what I'm going to present to you today, though, is, I guess, from uh, the two most recent projects, uh, which have both been pr primarily remote interviews because of the pandemic. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say was, um, when we exclude people from streets, we take away their ability to get out in the world independently, trapping them in their homes. So we've all, over the last couple of years, I guess, experienced what it's like to be trapped in our homes. And uh, I think we all know that we, you know, we don't really like it. And it, it has a huge impact on lots and lots of different areas of our lives. And, um, but if, if someone finds the streets too difficult for them to negotiate independently, then they're trapped in their home, you know, forever for the rest of their life. And um, 
that's a really, really awful thing for us to do to people um, through our own design decisions. And, um, and ultimately that's why I think this is a really important issue and why I think, you know, when people say, well, yeah, accessibility is important, but you know, there are other considerations that are, you know, that we should put prioritize ahead of accessibility. Uh, I, I don't really accept that argument because I think um, in terms of, you know, taking away someone's independent mobility in order to say to, to give someone else the choice of mode of, of transport, for example, I think isn't a very equitable thing to do, I guess, for that reason. Um, I also wanted to talk to you, I'm, I'm sure you know, but just in case, um, uh, you know, a lot of this kind of thinking, I guess, it's sort of grounded in in the social model of disability, um, which is this sort of um, idea that emerged in the 80s in, in disability studies. And, and it, it sort of, um, it constructs this thing called the medical model of disability, which says that, um, you know, people are, are broken, I guess, um, you know, because they're not like normal people. And that um, things that aim to help disabled people should be aiming to fix them and make them more like normal people. Um, and the social model kind of rejects that. And, and it says, well, everyone's different. Everyone's, we have, we'll have to very, we all have diverse needs and capabilities. And um, someone is only disabled because there's a poor fit between their needs and capabilities and the environment in which they're needing to operate, I guess, living and working and getting around. And, um, and if, you, if you fix the problems with the environment, then um, those people aren't disabled anymore. And as a designer, I find that's a very, very, very powerful kind of call to action, I guess. And I think it's a very useful, um, it's a very useful uh, thing to think about, I guess, when we're looking at all of these things. And also I think it, you know, but it makes it very clear that it's our fault, right? It's not disabled people's fault that they can't access the environment. It's our fault because we designed it wrong and we didn't include their needs. Um, another thing, that's important, and I guess I'll tease this out in, in the first project that I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, a journey is only as, as accessible as the weakest link in the chain. So, sort of, it doesn't matter how good um, bits of bits of accessibility on on the journey someone needs to make are, the the route is only accessible if if it's all accessible. And so, if you've got something on the route that they need to negotiate that isn't accessible, then you've broken the whole thing. Um, and so. That's why uh, often you have to drill into really, really the real details of, of things in order to work out whether there are problems. Um, another thing that I guess um, comes up a lot across all the projects I've worked on is um, once you start to look at how people with different impairments and different mobility strategies um, negotiate the same um, environments, you realize that uh, different groups of disabled people often have conflicting needs um, when it comes to the what they need from the environment and um, designing the most inclusive possible spaces involves understanding all the trade-offs that you're making between different people's needs and trying to make the best trade-offs. Um, so I, I guess a classic example of this is um, tactile paving and these are all quotes from uh, this project I'm about to talk to you about uh, that I've done for the City of London. And so um, on the left, we've got quotes by um, people who find tactile paving difficult, makes life more difficult for them. And then on the right, you've got, um, you've got quotes from people who uh, need tactile paving and for them, it's, it's essential for them to, to get around uh, on, the, on the street. I, I guess I'll read them out just in case uh, there's anyone um, using it that's, uh, uh, got, got experiences sight loss. Um, so tactile paving is an inconvenience because it jolts my insides so up to a manual wheelchair user. Um, I get really stressed out with tactile paving. I worry I might fall over or I might sprain my ankle or I might fall in the path of a car. Uh, that's a person with a walking impairment. Um, and then, sorry, I've got to work out how I can move the... Okay. Um, if I didn't get the tactile and the dog wasn't working as it should, I wouldn't know I was at the curb edge. That's a guide dog user. Um, there's nothing to feel where I need to cross. I need some tactile thing to indicate. Um, so yeah, we've got you know we've got basically some people that 
someone that finds it very, very uncomfortable to, to travel over tactile paving, someone that says basically, you know, if I walk on it, I feel like I'm going to fall over. And then we've got people who say, you know, I need it, otherwise I'm not going to know where the curve edge is, um, or I'm not going to know where the, the appropriate place to cross the road is. Um, so these quotes are all from this um, project that I've done um, for the City of London, where uh, they were sort of very interested in understanding these um, these trade-offs between different people's needs better. And um, um, what we've created is a, is a tool for basically uh, assessing the accessibility of, um, of their streets and trying to work out what the best trade-offs between different people's needs are where there is conflict. Um, and it, it kind of, um, in designing it, we started by sort of acknowledging that actually accessibility isn't quite a kind of binary, it's accessible, it's not accessible um, thing. For, for, for some things it is, but for a lot of things and a lot of people, there's this kind of um, area in between finding something easy and being excluded by it, where you're experiencing increasing levels of difficulty and frustration. And there's a point where then you're not able to uh, you're not able to deal with it anymore because it's depleting your levels of confidence and uh, and energy too much. Um, but you sort of might be able to deal with it once or twice, um, kind of okay, and uh, and sort of or it's making life more difficult for you, but you could deal with it all the time. Sort of so cleaving between that kind of the, that second situation, you know, someone in that position, which is sort of where that wheelchair user was with tactile paving, you know, for them, it's worth making them uncomfortable, I guess, if it means that we're making someone else who would be either totally excluded or find it so difficult that they'd be severely depleting their levels of confidence and energy dealing with it. Um, making their life easier and so those were the sort of trade-offs that we, we were trying to identify um identify with this project um we were also trying to make sure that we were um kind of covering the diversity of needs of of disabled people using the streets and obviously there are um you know i think 11 or 12 million um disabled people uh in the country but um and they've all got slightly different needs but um we do need to create some sort of segmentation so that we can um, we can try and make sure that we've 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 covered everyone, I guess, um, as much as possible. Um, without we can't interview eleven million people. Um, so uh, these are some segments that I sort of worked out across from doing lots of these projects based on the diversity of uh, of needs, I guess. So um, it, you know it makes sense to separate people with sensory impairment with visual impairments and people with mobility impairments by the mobility aids that they're using because uh or their mobility strategies because they potentially uh, end up having uh quite different um experiences and different needs and then because of that issue about you know accessibility only being as good as the weakest link um we we were kind of analyzing 45 different street features so basically all of the little elements that come together to to create the street experience but we we looked at each one individually with each participant because um, we uh, because anything any of them could have caused uh, caused a street to be inaccessible to that to that person potentially. Um, the we started off doing um, doing shadowing uh, because it was before the pandemic. We did a couple of pilots and then we moved it uh, remote because we couldn't do that anymore. Um, but here's uh yeah here are two participants um on out on um lower thames street um by the tower of london um so the instead of um instead of fo um following people on the route what we did was we did it on zoom and we showed them a video of the route and uh, we collected their comments um and that's sort of they're all arranged in this massive spreadsheet like this um and then um, for the people with sight loss, we audio described the video um, and then we also sent them out a box of tactile models um, that we sort of worked through as we were going through the video um, so that they sort of understood um, the layouts and the, uh, and the features that we were discussing each time. Um, and then uh, after we'd kind of 
gone through that, which was trying to be kind of an, like quite an open um, insight collection, I guess, to, to sort of get people to identify what were the significant issues with the journey. Um, then we basically went through that kind of list of all of those features and, um, and we got people to kind of um, feedback on each of the possible configurations for each of those features. And, uh, and we got them to give them a score basically based on uh, how helpful or unhelpful they were. Um, and then that kind of ended up populating this tool where um, you can basically, for each of the different features, you can configure the different options for it. And then you can see across all of the different segments uh, of, of uh, needs, um, how it's likely to be affecting them. So whether you're making life harder or easier and, so, you know, fours, you're making things easier than what people are normally expecting. And then uh, threes, neutral, twos, hard, but I can sort of deal with it. One is it's really, really hard and I wouldn't be able to deal with it more than once or twice. And then zero is I'm excluded no matter how I'm feeling. Um, and, uh, and then each kind of next to each segment and each feature, you've got this kind of thing you can hover over and then you can get, read all the quotes that people actually said uh, about uh, explaining why, um, they uh, felt that way. And I think that was, that's really important. And that's something that I felt like it, with previous projects, we've always kind of handed over a big PDF of insights, uh, um, you know, with full of quotes, but um, you know, they're normally like 50 pages and, and, and it's quite hard to find, to surface the right quote to the person that's actually in the situation of, of having a design problem and needing some insight to understand the best way to resolve it. And so that kind of, surfacing that information at the point where you've just told someone they're probably going to have a problem. Um, I'm, I think it's hopefully going to be quite helpful. Um, and uh, we're going to launch this thing for everyone to use um, on the 8th. So uh, if you follow me on Twitter, at Ross Atkin, or maybe Romy will send an email out or something or in, in an update when it's, when it's live uh, so that uh, other people can use it um because uh hopefully it's it's helpful i mean it, it it it's not trying to replace the engagement that you're already doing hopefully with disabled people but what it's uh you know we see it as a design tool that you can use early on in the design process in order to kind of catch um catch obvious problems i guess um and so that then you can use your engagement with disabled people um to to really work out what the best thing to do where you have problems is rather than point out you know where you where you are kind of we're, we're obviously going to have problems i suppose um so uh the other thing i wanted to talk about uh quickly was um i did some work for tfl last year on colorful crossings um which are kind of a new thing that um we've started to put we did start to put into the environment and um and they raised some sort of significant issues i guess um I, I suppose uh, they're one of those things where I think all of the people that were deploying them thought, well, there isn't an accessibility issue with these things. Um, and the kind of road safety auditor said, yeah, they're fine because, you know, they're on the pedestrian bit, not the car bit. Uh, but actually, um, when we spoke to disabled people about them, it turned out there were some quite considerable issues with them. Um, and uh, so the, and, but the other thing was, we also talked to some of the people that were deploying them about sort of why they were deploying them. And, and it seems like um, there was sort of quite a lot of different arguments for why you want, might put them in. One was to kind of the balance between pedestrians and, 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 uh, and vehicles. And one was trying to kind of give places, place like a distinct character and, uh, and then also, the, they're often tied into events, um, so it's kind of celebrating um, something happening or, or a space. Um, and so it was sort of, it was interesting that there was this diversity, but equally it was kind of, there wasn't a lot of clarity actually on why why we were doing these things. And also whether they, whether they actually were meeting the objectives that people claimed they were meeting. You know, there didn't seem much effort to kind of measure actually whether things are doing what we think they're doing. And I think that that's generally something it feels like we're not very good at in this environment, uh, uh, certainly when it comes to streets, I guess. Uh, and I think that's something we should, we should get a lot better at, I think is making it clear what it is we're trying to achieve by doing something and then checking whether we're actually achieving it. 
because again, if we're, if we're talking about making trade-offs, then it's a lot easier to understand those trade-offs if we understand what is the benefit that we're getting from doing something. Um, so uh, the first and kind of obvious issue is um, a lack of consistency, uh, particularly people with sight loss uh, rely on, on a whole load of different cues uh, from their environment about, uh, about in order to orientate themselves and, and work out what to do. And um, if things about the crossing are different to all the other crossings you're using, then um, that's going to create uh, issues for uh, for you probably, and 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 it did with the public since we spoke to. Um, and then um, there were these kind of issues that were more specific to different designs, that, but were kind of interesting. So um, some of the designs are very busy visually, and um, they uh, led to people feeling overstimulated, and both people with sight loss and um, um, people with neurodiversity. Um, and then um, there is also this issue where um, you've got these kind of high contrast shapes within the decoration that you're putting on the crossing and, and um, that causes people with sight loss who rely on their residual vision to um, interpret them as holes potentially or other kind of hazards on the, on the street. And, um, and that then, you know, they're having to kind of slow down and check and that's the last thing you want them to be doing in the middle of the kind of crossing phase uh, of, of a crossing. And then um, TFL seemed like kind of absorbed some of that feedback and then sort of recommended that they be more blocky and more kind of um, uniform in color, but more like this one I'm showing below, which is made up of a series of green and yellow, um, green and yellow blocks. But um, this one uh, is, um, Basically, these kind of non-orthogonal lines um, for certain participants, they said it felt like they would it would be pulling them away from going straight across the crossing, um, which uh, was also um, was also sort of problematic for them. And so that was quite interesting, and that was something I hadn't kind of foreseen, I guess, before doing the work. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about was um, cycle infrastructure and. Um, you know, I think this is a kind of, I guess, an increasing, we're creating certain accessibility issues with some of the cycle infrastructure we're deploying and some of the ways we're deploying it. And um, and I think it's because some of the people deploying it have, I think, don't quite have the, a, a full understanding of the interaction between um, cycles and certain groups of disabled people. And so here's um, one of the participants we, sh you know, we did, the pilot shadowing for the city of london project on kind of crossing a, a cycle track at uh, a bus stop bypass and and you know here it's sort of working out this this gentleman's got a, a tiny pinprick of kind of tunnel vision in one eye um but for him that was enough to kind of be able to see that that cyclist had stopped and and obviously that cyclist also stopped so we've got a happy outcome here of a person with sight loss crossing a cycle track and it's all working out well but um Obviously, lots of times cycles don't stop, and we know that because uh, when they do the monitoring, we know that. And um, and also, lots of times you haven't got anywhere near the kind of sight lines that you have on this one um, or the space. Um, and lots of times, lots of people with sight loss don't have that very handy tiny bit of central vision that this gentleman has. Um, so uh, the the other important thing I think to, to bear in mind is. Um, and, and again, this comes up over and over again in projects um, that uh, disabled people, and not just people with sight loss, um, but particularly people with sight loss, um, perceive uh, perceive conflict with cycles quite differently to, I think, the way cyclists perceive kind of interactions with cycles, I guess. So uh, a cyclist might feel like they were cycling past someone safely and giving them space. But um, a, a disabled people might not feel that way. Um, oh, sorry, I'm talking about the wrong thing. That's uh, that's this slide. Um, so um, yeah, there's something about bikes that nerve me. I think they're thinking I need to get out of the way uh, because they're on a bike. Uh, I can see enough to know if they suddenly come, and then um, that's a residual sight user. And then the guide dog user saying they come out of nowhere. They ride right in front of you, and because they assume you can't see. They can get away with anything. These people do not understand what it's like. And if I say something even politely at all, like, I get loads of abuse. 
um, and uh, electric reducing. I saw a cyclist with a person and that was scary. So this kind of, um, you know, this idea that you might have created this space where pedestrians and cyclists are interacting and you think it's fine because there isn't, no one's hitting each other, but you could potentially, that space could still be feeling extremely hostile to, um, to quite a lot of disabled people potentially. And, uh, and, and they're likely to just avoid it. And so you're kind of excluding them and you, you wouldn't even notice, I guess, because you're not seeing loads of people getting hit by bikes. And actually, if you went and watched, you'd say, well, these are safe interactions, but they don't necessarily to, to, um, to, to a lot of people, just a lot of disabled people. And I guess a lot of this stuff we're, we're building primarily because we want to increase subjective safety for cyclists in order to encourage mass cycling. And so, um, it's sort of a bit of a worry, I guess. Uh, and then the other thing is, I think people assume that um, crossing a cycle way is safer and easier than crossing a, a carriageway with, with cars in it. But um, again, almost like when we, are, we asked that question specifically in this City of London project, and many more people said that they found it harder to cross the cycle way. And that wasn't just people with sight loss, that was people with lots and lots of different impairments um basically because they're not very confident that cyclists can give way to them primarily i suppose and that their cyclists are much harder to perceive and so um yeah i think this kind of idea well, well obviously they're less dangerous than cars people should you know just man up and 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 get across the cycle track um you know it, it's not actually that simple when when you talk to people about it um and so i guess to kind of come back to that first image i showed you um i think you know, you've got great lines of sight, you've got lots of space if something goes wrong. Um, you, you, you know, it's a lot easier to resolve these conflicts there than it is in the second image on the right where, you know, you've got a lot less space. It's, you've got this kind of kink in the cycle track um, so that you haven't necessarily got great lines of sight. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think in those environments, it's going to be much harder to resolve this conflict. And um, maybe we should be thinking about whether putting this kind of infrastructure in those environments is the best, uh, the best way of making uh, one of these kind of narrow, very mixed use streets um, better for people to cycle up. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, hopefully, I've run over a bit, sorry. Um, but hopefully we can have a discussion now. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting, as I knew it would be. <laughs> uh, Paul, do you want to come back in now and uh, we'll have a quick look at this poll um, and then get on with some questions. We've got one in so we can read that uh, later. Um, I'll just start sharing again and move things on. Um, Okay. I, yeah, I'm, I'm very keen to reflect on the poll, actually. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I see if I can share this again. I think I can so that you can see it. I'm not sure if you can do that any other way. So hopefully you can actually read all of that now. So we were just saying a level access comes out strongly more than anything else, actually. Um, I don't know what your reflections on those sorts of things are. I mean, there's some that are all about the same place, tactile seating, lighting, toilet, signage. And then, yeah, signalised crossings, which we were talking about being quite low on the list, only yeah, one I, person. I think, I, yeah, I mean, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see like the toilets and the seating up mm. quite high. Because to me, I think those, that's something that I think people don't appreciate enough. And so it's, it's good that you guys are on board with that, it seems. Mm. Um, I think that, uh, I think that vehicle access and signalised crossings are really important. Um, I think the signalised crossings are really important for, you know, it's one of those things again where there isn't really there isn't really a trade off between different needs. It's like almost everyone, all of the different need segments that kind of I'm, I'm, of different people I'm talking to, they almost all feel a lot better about signalised crossings than not mm. signalised crossings, and um, and so I think they're a they're a big accessibility issue and obviously. Um, you know, they kind of come in and out of fashion. And I think that's, you know, when they were in fashion, I think we were we were doing better than when they've kind of fallen out of fashion a bit. Um, and then I think vehicle access is also super important. Basically, the reason vehicle access is really important is because if we've got it wrong, which we do 
a lot, mm. then that's how people are going to get places, right? Like if people with sight loss who need to get to somewhere they're not familiar with, or they need to get somewhere they are familiar with, but there's a big accessibility issue on the street, um, they will get a taxi there and they'll get the person, the taxi driver to, you know, wait outside and, and take them to the door of the place that they want to find. Because often finding the door is actually the, of a place that's unfamiliar is the hardest bit. And so they're compensating for um, not, for, for, for the poor job we've made on making the environment accessible by using a motor vehicle to get there. And that's, that's not an uncommon thing. Also, you know, people who have walking impairments and, and find it very, very draining to, to uh, you know, to, 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 to get somewhere might take a taxi there so that they can use their energy for the thing that they meant to get there for. Um, mm. And, mm. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, the, yeah, anyone who's got kind of a limited range, which is quite common, lots and lots of different impairments can, 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 can put you in that situation. You know, they're, they're very, very likely to, uh, to be using a, a vehicle one way or another to extend that range. And so, um, you know, I think this kind of <laughs> managing vehicle access so that people who really, really need it have it while still reducing the volume of vehicles i think something really important that we you know we need to get a lot better at uh if we're going to kind of um if we're going to create environments that we want to create where it's really really pleasant to walk and cycle but at the same time not be excluding people by doing that mm. yeah no i think it, it just shows the importance of all of those aspects and i think i'd, I'd like to return to colorful crossings because uh, that's what kind of brought this whole conversation with you Paul up in the first place and I saw um Stephen hello Stephen he was the winner of our most joined person last year um he's got a question on them he says if if the design is right would colorful right in inverted um what are inverted commas yeah would colorful crossings be useful to remind drivers of the new highway code where drivers are to give way to pedestrians when turning into side roads I guess your answer is it, it's hard to get those right. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, look, I think the side road thing is super interesting. Uh, I don't think colourful crossings would be a good way of uh, dealing with that. I mean, maybe, I, maybe, because I, I think that's the point. If you just painted it all buff, right? If you painted mm. the road buff or retarmacked it buff, at, uh, or, or yeah, if you painted it all one solid colour, basically, people you know, it, it seems likely that, that wouldn't create problems for people. And that certainly if you did it consistently in an area, then um, it would probably be quite helpful because you'd be increasing the meaningful tonal contrast in the environment. Mm. And that's generally quite a helpful thing to do. Um, Consistency, yeah. Yeah, if you did it consistently. And, and that's probably, you know, that's probably cheaper than doing um, like a Copenhagen style wow. paving that, you know, because I again, I'm kind of, I think they're all right. I'm, I'm really annoyed that we're deploying those without tactile paving and are continuing to do that. Mm. Because, um, you know, as a sighted person coming up to one of those Copenhagen crossings, you're aware that you are crossing a road, even yeah. if it's paved as, as, you know, and, and you want to, the, the design is trying to imply that you have priority, which I think it, it you know, it does a decent job of doing, but you are still aware of the situation that you might be encountering a car there. And if mm. you don't put the tactile paving there, then you're not affording that courtesy to people with sight loss. And, and I think this idea that like, oh, well, if we put the tactile paving there, then cars will assume priority over pedestrians. I think that's just, uh, mm. I, you know, I, I haven't seen any evidence to support that. Maintains that, yeah. It's like an assumption that people make that I don't think is evidenced. And so, mm. uh, you know, I think if we want to do some work, I think it'd be really interesting to do work at TRL, right? To like really, really drill down into what are exactly the things that cause drivers to assume priority mm. in certain situations. Um, but you know that work hasn't been done, and so I think uh, we should be deploying that type of thing in those situations. But but Paul massively impressed me when we spoke initially, and you showed a plan um, from your previous presentation, and uh, it was it was just some crossings and some tactile and you knew exactly I mean not even just down to the city you knew where in London it was Paul 
So I don't know if you want to um, give a little bit of background on on your studies and thoughts into the subject and how how you'd noted that so okay so well, well. Uh, thank you I wouldn't call it a study rather it's um, I live <laughs> I live in the city of London and I, I basically walk everywhere across London mm. um, and one of my walks from um, the city goes takes me down uh, 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 the Blackfriars Road toward Blackfriars Bridge and there's been a huge number of roadworks by I assume transport for London over the past five years um, and it was very interesting that the image that Ross showed was of the new the current layout which has taken that very very large busy road um, and has created a number of cycle lanes um, and Blackfriars Bridge is, is very interesting for, for very sad reasons. A number of the a number of people have died over the past few years in terms of the, the road mm. layout. So clearly there's been an urgency in terms. Of, but it was interesting that as a cyclist, you're directed, the cycle lane keeps crossing the road, it moves over a few times, but also there's a separate cycle lane, there's a separate area for buses. Um, and I've always just found it as someone who, who walks and does stay at the ground as well as the buildings is is just a sense of confusion and that's led me to a couple of questions um which really is around the importance of familiarity because on the one hand it clearly makes sense to keep developing the built shared environment um to do research to to to, to pilot new projects but equally I, the question i've got is how important is it that there should be a sense of consistency and ross has already touched on that in terms of the, the, the textures and colours of what would normally be, say, um, a pedestrian crossing. But in terms of um, the materials that are used, um, there's an issue of familiarity. Uh, I'm aware, for example, if you visit Berlin, um, it is very easy to distinguish between the space for cars, for cycles and for pedestrians. Each of these are cobbled. And over the past, as, as unification has rebuilt the whole of that city, that same palette of diamond shaped cobbles, larger cobbles, um, is, has been implemented consistently across the whole of the city. So you literally know where you are standing or cycling or driving. Uh, mm. That is not the case, as far as I know, in any UK city. It certainly isn't the case in the centre of London. So I'm interested to know how important it might be um, to be very, very familiar. And I've got a second question, which is around uh, representation on crossings, because a few years ago, um, I came across my first rainbow street crossing. And as a gay man, I thought, oh, that's lovely. The mayor of London, you know, really cares about me. On the other hand, equally, um, the creation of um, so on the one hand there's a sense of that th there's a kind of a, a, the city is it making an acknowledgement of certain aspects of diversity on the other hand the what is a crossing is being diluted because that crossing is now painted rainbow colors uh, it's not painted in say black and white stripes and there's it's a balance between you know as Ross says uh, you know how it is being evaluated about doing something which may appear to be beneficial, but equally is quite literally disorientating. So mm. a couple of questions around um, familiarity and consistency there. Uh, can I deal with the second one first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, uh, I think it's really good. We should be trying to make places feel more distinctive. Um, and I think it's a shame. I think we went too far. I think we got obsessed with identical looking stainless steel street furniture which isn't even very easy for people with sight loss to you know with low vision to pick out against the, the paving materials we use and and uh you know we got obsessed with making things that didn't necessarily need to be uniform ultra uniform and then everything felt everything every place started to feel the same and we didn't have any local distinctiveness and then everyone was panicking then about how to reintroduce local distinctiveness and a sense of place. And then they were like, oh yeah, let's paint the crossing. But it was like the worst possible place to do it because it's like the most safety critical <laughs> bit mm. of the bit of the environment and the bit that, you know, that benefits the most from being consistent. So, uh, you know, I think, I think we really should be thinking about how to make places feel more distinctive. And I think street furniture is a wonderful way to do that. Um, I think, yeah, painting the, the crossing probably isn't a great way of doing that. Um, and then I think, uh, to, to your first point, I think we, we missed a trick not 
like they could they could have made all of the cycle tracks in london they built them all in the last five years right mm. and they could have made them all the same color they were all paid for by tfl yeah um you know mm. and they and they did a lot of work to standardize a lot of other things about them um and i just don't understand why they didn't do that yeah. and i think it's you know it's it that's something that's harmed everyone right it's 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 harder to cycle on them it's yeah. harder for drivers to interact with them it's harder for disabled people to to, to deal with it. it was just uh yeah a terrible missed opportunity mm. um uh, and i think uh but i think that the the, the point about we want to make things better we want to make the streets better but but we are going to make life more difficult for people just by making changes whether they're making it better or not i think that's true and so again we need to get better at, at making those changes i guess partly like if most of the changes we were making if, if we if we were always making things better when we were changing something, people would be a lot less suspicious about it. <laughs> but because yeah. quite often we're not making things better, I think that that we're getting some resistance there. I think, uh, yeah, particularly people with sight loss, but actually lots of other. I mean, people with sight loss are navigating using usually using detailed mental models of mental maps of the environment, right? And they're relying on navigating between a series of cues that they're picking up in that environment and if any of those cues change or are missing, it, they can get very disorientated very, very fast. Um, that's definitely true. Um, mm. But also something that I think disabled street users have in common or, or, or tend to do a lot more than non-disabled street users is research and plan the journeys they're going to make and, and you know, confine themselves more than non-disabled street users to particular routes that they know well and if they're doing a route that they're not familiar with to spend more time looking at it on google maps and talking to other people about it and uh you know to to, to, to plan right because you know there's just a lot more scope for things going wrong and getting trapped somewhere where there isn't a drop curb or or lots and lots and lots of terrible things happening to people um so mm. uh i think you know you're always disproportionately affecting those people by making changes uh, uh but i guess the flip side of that is that if you're doing something helpful that's helpful in a particular context in my view at least it's worth sacrificing a bit of standardization in order to do something helpful in context so i my a good example of that is guidance paving i think that there's guidance paving is this kind of tactile paving that's got these long lozenges um, and it's written in the guidance and it's never deployed, almost never. And um, it's something that's not helpful to all people with sight loss. It's mainly only really helpful to long pain users. Um, but um, for those people, it can be really, really helpful because it's very easy to get lost in space if you're walking in a, in a, in a, in a wide space, whether you haven't got a building line or a curb line to follow. Um, and so it would be great to see it deployed in those situations. The reason it's not, I think, is that there's this kind of expectation that the tactile paving should always be, someone should be able to be dropped anywhere in the country, not familiar with it, and be able to use the tactile paving usefully and work mm -hmm. out what's going on. And obviously, if you've got a run of guidance paving that links two places and you don't know what those two places are, it's no use to you. But if you're walking that route every day and you do know those two places, then that guidance paving is really, really helpful to you. And the, the idea that it might confuse the person that got parachuted in, I think, isn't an argument for not deploying it. Mm, yeah, can, no, it's a good point. Can I ask, can I ask a supplementary question, <laughs> um, which just occurs to me, and I don't know if it's an area you've done research. Um, uh, for many landscape architects, there's a huge commitment now to sustainable drainage, and there's a lot of investment by local authorities in rain gardens and sustainable drainage along uh, alongside pavements. Um, and it, uh, just a question, I wonder if this could also be an area which could go disastrously wrong if we're effectively moving from a solid pavement and a solid curb to um, something that you really don't want to walk into. And yet there's no particular way of avoiding that happening. And I wonder if you'd been able to do any research on that yet. Uh, I haven't specifically. I mean, I've definitely shadowed people on, on routes that have got grass verges. So I guess that's, that's kind of, and, and that's, that's quite common outside London, I guess. 
but this would be where you have say a rain garden you you it, you, you wouldn't you're not able to walk in it because you may well start to sink into it yeah that's sort of the same you, you know again the average grass verge i feel like the you know the grass is like a yeah yeah sure, and sure. If you've got, uh, you, you know you don't you don't necessarily people are trying generally trying not to walk in it anyway yeah 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 um, i look i think the majority of long cane users i've shadowed try and follow the building line more than they try and follow the curve line right yeah um and but in a way that's that sets up some some challenges in itself um i think uh and then the majority of guide dog and pe guide dog users and people who are relying on their residual site are normally tending to try and walk down the center of the of the footway so yeah i think things on the curve line per se aren't are a disaster and actually again that was something we asked people specifically on the city project was like if, you're, if there's going to be street furniture where would you rather it was and and generally people seem to prefer that it was closer to the curb than closer to the building line um mm -hmm. but uh where you've got a lot of space probably again that's probably a situation where guidance paving would be quite helpful uh for keeping long cane users out of the mm -hmm. out of the water garden um again i think that there's a yeah just thinking about it there's they've, they've done that on wick road on the cycle track i live in hackney so i know a lot about what goes on in hackney but um and it actually occludes the sight lines into the floating bus stops so i think that was definitely a mm. not a good move in my opinion uh, no and i think you don't you don't want to be doing that we've got a question from david wilkinson actually it might be a good point to ask this it, it would be interesting to hear the panel's view on low curbs between footway carriageway or footway cycleway be it shared space or a small upstand of say 25 mil you know the sort of almost fully shared have you got views on that that very very low curb i have very strong views on that <laughs> excellent strong, and i'm 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 fuming about oh because I didn't know we were going to stumble into this. <laughs> they just issued. They just issued new tactile paving guidance, and it's mm. still there. Mm. Twenty-five mil curb, and it's like there's there's most of this stuff, right? Hasn't been studied in a controlled large sample kind of um, kind of bit of research, right? Almost none mm -hmm. of it. Almost none of it. Almost everything we're kind of relying on. Well, someone did some research with ten people at some point in the eighties, and that's what they wrote the guidance on. And uh, you know, or or I'm like, well, I shadowed, you know, whatever X people over X years, and I think this, but you know, I don't really know because none of it's statistically significant. But um, mm -hmm. the uh, one of the very, very, very few things that has been studied in in that this kind of very, very controlled environment in in the Pamela lab at UCL which has now been replaced by something even bigger and more more but it's a, a lab where they can build little bits of street and then they can get lots and lots and lots of people to negotiate those little bits of street and capture their movements with cameras and, and it's you know very 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 hardcore quantitative research mm. um, and yeah one of the few things that's been run through that is this question of like how high does the curve need to be to be readily detectable by people with sight loss and you know, we know from that that it needs to be at least 50 mil high <laughs> and, mm. and ideally probably 60. Uh, and so uh, I think it's 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 madness that we're still people are still putting in the 25 mil. And uh, and it's also, I think, madness that they didn't change that in the tactile paving guidance that they've literally issued two weeks ago. Mm, yeah, and uh, actually something Kate uh, Carpenter Kins mentioned was that uh, she was talking about another um aspect uh but said at the end of her comment unfortunately um the new guidance hasn't really addressed various things she, she mentioned neurodivergent um yeah. needs and actually we're going to run uh fika on that topic uh in the next few months so i'll leave that for now but thank you kate for your comments um that's really interesting and um there were a couple of other ones i wanted to just quickly read out you can see most of the links that have been sent um but just about seating Stephen the importance of seats um to rest and actually somebody anonymously has mentioned people living with low covid including themselves people with me other conditions and I think BS8300 mentions that we should be putting seating every 50 meters I mean this isn't a 
you know, an attempt for us to flog more seats by any means, but it is a really important aspect of uh, inclusivity. And uh, I wanted to bring you in, Paul, to talk about the next um, mm. edition of the journal. Uh, there's a few comments, I think, that are worth looking at in the questions uh, tab, but uh, you can do that in your own time. But would you like to just explain the, the topics that you're covering next month? Because I think it's going to be a really important issue. Great. Thank you. So um, the, the edition that I'm working on is due to be published in the middle of February. Uh, we're focusing, um, each journal has a theme, although there are a number that we keep coming back to. So part of the journal is devoted to COP26. Um, what do we do next? A lot of reflections on the thoughts on what happened, but more importantly, what action should take place next? Um, but the, at the heart of the journal is, is, is a number of features which originally came out of the conference that the LI did in June last year on exactly this topic. Um, and I'm just looking at the proofs as we go through. So for people who weren't able to come to that conference, we've got an account of that and the whole lot is, is, is held online on our campus um, platform. We are looking at the issue of diversity in terms of who gets to be either a landscape architect or an architect and we've got an article um, from the head of Accelerate which is a program run by London Open City and supported by, by, by the Landscape Institute. Um, we've also got um, a very well we've got a, an article by by, by Romy uh who, oh, yeah, I've, Amir, forgotten. I've forgotten about that and <laughs> so this, this is really fascinating because five years ago we ran a conference at Sheffield University and it was the first time the organization had looked at the issue of diversity and particular um gender parity within the profession um Romy gave a tea keynote lecture or a keynote speech five years ago and what I asked Romy to do is to say have we made any progress since then, so I will leave you to read the article to see if you think that either the profession or the institute has made progress. Um, we've got a very interesting piece uh, from a relatively new organisation called Making Space for Girls, which is looking at the way in which play equipment is not only designed and installed, but in a sense, who gets to use any of the play equipment within, within a park or shared public space. Um, we've got a piece on... Um, engagement with young people and different techniques being used, a case study uh, in Aberfeldy. Um, we also have, uh, there's a new book coming out in May, published by Reba on queer spaces, and we've got a very interesting set of articles by the authors of that book. We also have, we've talked about cycling, but we've got a piece called Not All Cyclists Are Lycra Clad Iron Men, looking at different approaches to cycling. Um, and again, a very fascinating study of different ways of looking at cycling. There's a piece which really touches on what we've looked at already on intersectionality in the design of landscape. And um, a piece, uh, well, it's called Ramp Rage, which is by um, a member of a, a disability group in, Ac in, in Thanet called Access Thanet, just looking at some of the ways in which that particular borough uh, treats people or works with people who use wheelchairs. We've got an article, as I said, an excellent article, um, Auditing and Accessibility, which is looking specifically at the study that Ross did um, for the City of London Corporation, which is due to be published uh, later this month. We also have a piece on, uh, there's a book which I strongly recommend called Black Landscapes Matter, uh, written by the American landscape architect Walter Hood. So we've got a review of that book. Um, and we've also got a very interesting uh, picture story on the redressing of um, statues in in Liverpool. And then we've got um, a very interesting piece looking at um, Green Unpleasant Land um, by Professor Corinne Fowler, who many of you will know because of the work she's been doing recently with the National Trust. And then our policy section um, looks, there's, as many of you will know, an awful lot has happened in terms of uh, government consultations and guidance. So we've got an update on that. Um, so this will be um, sent automatically to LI members in the middle of February, but is also available for everyone to, to read online at, at the same time. Fabulous. No, thank you. I hope everybody uh, signs, up, signs up for that if they haven't already. Um, it will be available, obviously, shortly, you, you mentioned. So looking forward to it. Um, mm. I need to bring this to a close because it's 12 o'clock, I think. So I, I'll whiz through these next few slides um, very quickly. Uh, hopefully, 
you can see how the subject that we've talked about today fits with SDG 10.2 and hopefully ways in which we can all make positive changes in, in our work and um, be more aware of these everyday inequalities. And so hopefully, you know, that's that's going to make a difference to the way you're thinking. That's the intent really behind this speaker series. And uh, very quickly, also, if you'd like to hear more, do sign up for our newsletter, which is on the About Us page of our website, and we'll ensure we keep you up to date with everything we're planning. I'm sorry if I'm cast in a sickly yellow glow because I've got this enormous yellow screen now casting that all over me. I'll move on quickly. Uh, social media wise, do follow us, particularly probably on Instagram, and that will keep you um, abreast of all the things that we're talking about, which often do include diversity and social inclusion in particular. And as I mentioned, uh, there are a few upcoming um, speakers on the topic next month. Again, reduced inequalities. That's going to be on um, designing dementia friendly landscapes. Uh, March is going to be including Make Space for Girls and Betong Park, who are Norwegian designers of skate parks. Um, and we're going to talk about excluding young people and particularly girls from parks and open spaces. We are planning a neurodivergent um, FICA in a, in a couple of months time as well. So, you know, keep following us and you'll see. Um, but thank you to everyone who joined us today and I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget that this counts towards your CPD commitment for the Landscape Institute or any other institute you might be a member of. Um, and bear in mind our competition. We, we have a winner that we're taking in September to see our new factory, the Plus in Norway. Um, and we will be doing the same next year for, for somebody who joins us the most times during 2022. So uh, do stay in touch. Um, and thank you particularly to Paul and Ross for today's um, involvement and, and thoughts and uh, teachings. I think it's relevant. And my colleagues, Matt and Jack, who are in the background helping with all the background functions, do follow Paul and Ross on Twitter and you'll get more of all of this sort of uh, topic. So thanks. So that, thanks to you all again and uh, have a great weekend. See you soon, hopefully.